hear about. How about that? <laughs> that I chose. Uh, so I entered into this, I, I think, um, with the idea that I would select, maybe go through each sort of era of church history and choose one. Um, but more importantly, the criteria for me was how are these compelling evidence of what we know the church to be today? Like, how did we get here today, and what would be those specific milestones? And then I came up with about 400. So um, then I was able to narrow that down to, to about a dozen, and now I have five. But to think about the, the church, I think the, the way we really have to, the, the main criteria here is, the church being the depository of truth, right? Capital T, truth, the depository of truth. And to remember that it is a human institution. Yeah? I'm looking around, I need some heads nodding. Right, this is a human institution, but of divine origin. And what it, that means is that there are human moments in the church but the Holy Spirit guides the church, always. We don't have to worry about the church failing because we've been promised it's not going to. So, founded by Jesus Christ. So everybody's probably wondering then, what on, the, on earth is that background right there, right? Anybody know what that background is? Santa Claus being bad. All right. All right, well, that's one way to put it. Um, it's a human moment in church history that I'm going to talk about a little bit because this is actually one of those peak moments uh, centers around the first ecumenical council of the church. Craig, you had a question? Is that what? No. I mean, Constantine called the council. No. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if, if this church were of human origin... I think it would not stand. A survey of history is going to easily demonstrate that for us. Because what occurred to me, I was actually thinking about this yesterday, what occurred to me as these five moments sort of coalesced for me is that in each one of them they have in common that they capture not only, of course, the human moments, and some of them quite dramatic, but also, more importantly, is the fact that there is, you can see the providence of God. You can see the work of the Holy Spirit weaving together all of these moments that we're going to be talking about. Because if it were man who were in charge of this institution, we wouldn't be here this morning talking about it. Right? There wouldn't be anything to talk about. So I've chosen these few, these few high points for us. First of all, the very first one, and we're going to go, sort of go chronologically. And then at the end, we're going to leap about 400 years into, into um, uh, the future from one point. So the calling of the Council of Nicaea is where I really wanted to begin, uh, called in the year 325 by the Emperor Constantine. And it was, of course, the, what we call the first of the ecumenical councils. I'm going to end today by looking at the last ecumenical council, which was the 21st uh, ecumenical council of Second Vatican. But Constantine called this, remember Constantine is the first Christian Roman emperor. Everybody know that? You do now, right? First Christian Roman emperor. He had a pretty dramatic conversion experience, <clears throat> excuse me, the Christianity that he experienced in the year 312. He was actually in battle against a rival. Um, we're coming out of a period in Roman history where there actually were four separate uh, sort of provinces of the Roman Empire, each one ruled by a, a Caesar. And he was going to sort of end that period, the Tetrarchy, we call it. And so he went to battle with a rival, a uh, place called Milvian Bridge in the year 312, and was triumphant in that battle. But he credited his victory at Milvian Bridge to having seen a cross of light in the sky the night before the battle. And he heard this voice that said, by this you will conquer. So from that point forward, the cross became, actually the Cairo symbol, became uh, part and parcel of the, of the equipment of the Roman legion. It was on the shield of every Roman soldier from that point forward, with few exceptions. So that's a very dramatic conversion to Christianity. 
in the year 313, the following year, he uh, established uh, what's called the Edict of Milan. It was given in Milan, and it was to make Christianity legal throughout the empire. So for the really the first time, Christianity comes out of the catacombs, moves out of the underground churches, uh, doesn't have to be secretive anymore, and can be out in the open. So this is pretty, you know, this is a pretty dramatic turn in church history is Constantine's conversion. But then what happened, of course, is that there began to be some divergent teachings uh, in the church. For instance, uh, there was a presbyter, a priest by the name of Arius from Alexandria in Egypt who was teaching and developed, actually developed quite a following, which is kind of the scary part about it. He began teaching that God the Father and Jesus the Son were not co-equal beings. In fact, Jesus was a created being. Okay, I'm going to let that set for a minute. Everybody understand what I'm saying? So there was a time, therefore, when Jesus did not exist. Yeah? Well, why is this problematic? This is, not, this is not the faith that had been delivered to the apostles that the apostles then handed down to that first generation, second generation. This is not apostolic teaching. It's not apostolic truth. And Constantine, fearing for the unity of the church, called a council, all the bishops, to meet in Nicaea in Turkey uh, to consider this question about the nature of of the relationship between the father and the son, specifically, although obviously out of this you'll, you'll see comes, comes much more than that. So Arius was at um, the Council of Nicaea. He was able to speak. He was able to defend his position, uh, which had absolutely no agreement. There was no agreement. As a matter of fact, the consensus upon, of the bishops upon arriving at Nicaea was to oppose Arius. And we even have a record of um, St. Athanasius, who's, who you're going to be introduced to here in just a moment if you don't already know him. St. Athanasius um, of Alexandria actually produced a version of the creed, uh, actually showed up at the council with it. Now, it was, be, just be grateful that the council didn't adopt the Athanasian creed because it's about this long. Memorize that, right, for Sunday morning. But, but it did contain the essentials of sort of what was the consensus of the apostolic teaching. He was present at that council, as was uh, St. Nicholas, St. Nicholas of Mera in, in Turkey also, who was a very staunch defender of traditional teaching about Jesus and God, the Father being the same substance, the same essence, the same being. So what you see depicted here is a moment that's captured in, in for lack of a better way to say this, guys, it's, it's kind of like an urban legend. Except that, well, I guess that's a more contemporary term. It's, it's captured in sort of the oral tradition of, of this council, and particularly in the Eastern Church. This is a story that's, that's often repeated. The debates became very heated at Nicaea. And this is recorded, we do know this, it's recorded by the historian for the Emperor Constantine, whose name was Eusebius of Caesarea. Um, he actually wrote a very good history that's called from the church, uh, the, the history of the church from Christ to Constantine. And he records what happened at the council. He tells us what people were wearing, no lie, especially the emperor. We know what color the emperor wore every day. Guess what color the emperor wore every day? Purple. That's very good, purple. Um, he records what people were eating, and he also recorded the debates and how they became very, very heated at, at points in time. The, the moment that you see depicted on this slide is a mosaic, actually, um, that, that shows St. Nicholas standing up in the middle of the, the debates and punching Arius in the face. Okay, very human moment that's captured. 
He was so angered, as the tradition goes, he was so angered at Arius' insistence that, that Christ was a created being that St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, jumped up and hit him in the face. Now what's interesting about this, this particular legend is that you would think that something that dramatic would have been captured in the history of the council that Eusebius, who if you read his, his history, he's a great historian, but he's also a gossip. I mean, that kind of comes through. And so I think he would have reported this. I, I, I'm actually, um, I, I think, quite surprised that he didn't if it, if it really did happen. But doesn't it make a great story? And it makes for great memes that circulate on the Internet every, every Advent and Christmas season. We see this. Yes, don't, right, exactly. I, I've, come to bring, I've come to bring presents to children and punch out heretics. Um, more famous one I've seen. It's a great story. But it does speak to the interplay, I think, between, um, that, I, that I mentioned at the beginning, the inter interplay between this as being a very human institution involving human beings and that very complex interplay, therefore, with, with the divine order uh, of our salvation that the church is. So, um, so thank goodness we are, we are not in charge, right? The result of this council was our Nicene Creed. That is the result of that council, the statement of our faith. And what does it say about the nature of God the Father and Jesus the Son? What's the word? Consubstantial. Very good. Consubstantial. God from God and light from light. Constantine, now interestingly, did something else. He also created a second capital of the empire. At this time that, um, that particularly by, by the 4th century, the Roman Empire has spread actually to its furthest boundaries by this point in time. There's not going to be much, um, if any, addition, I think, after, well, actually not much after the time of, of Caesar Augustus. But it spread to its furthest boundaries, and he realized that um, coming out of that model that had existed previously, of the Tetrarchy, where you had four Caesars, he decided that he would establish a second capital in the eastern part of the empire so that this imperial order could kind of be shared. Uh, the governance, he didn't intend to create another, another Caesar, he, in, he intended to create another capital. Does that make sense? So, he does. He established a second capital at Constantinople. You can see there on the straits going into the Black Sea. Constantinople, you probably don't have any trouble figuring out who he named the city for, <laughs> right? Himself, Constantinople. The old Greek city of Byzantium. Byzantium had been an old, um, like, fishing village, uh, but, but it had a very prominent place right there geographically on the straits going into the, into the Black Sea. It was the center, sort of the heart of the center of trade and commerce in the Roman Empire. Uh, in the east, so he established a second capital there. And he unknowingly created a rivalry of sorts. Do you see how that would happen? Human beings, what we are, how that would sort of create a rivalry between the city of the east and the city of the west. Well, which one is better? Which one is, is prettier? Which one has the better churches? Which one has the better art? Right? And it's accentuated by the fact that there are huge cultural differences between the eastern part of the empire and the western part of the empire. Language, for instance. The language of the east was? Greek. Greek. The language of the west was? Latin. The geographical divide, therefore, is even greater than it looks on a map because language is the primary indicator we have of culture. And that's, that is the thing that holds culture together, is a shared language. So there's already a huge cultural divide. And as time went on, the, um, the East was confronting, confronting the growing spread of a new religion. Islam. 
Islam is growing in the eastern part of the empire, or in areas that are touching upon the eastern part of the empire, a problem the West wasn't having to deal with at this point in history. And it's not, it's not that the rise of Islam is a threat to Christianity. It is that Islam, for, for Islam, any sort of a, a representation of a religious uh, nature, for instance, statues, especially three-dimensional statues, uh, images of any kind, a stained glass, that all represents graven images. So Eastern emperors with the capital in Constantinople, when the empire shifts to Constantinople after the fall of the Western Empire in 476, the imperial seat moves to Constantinople. Those Eastern emperors came under the pressure of, uh, of Islam and, and relented in many ways by allowing for the destruction of images. It's called iconoclasm. Iconoclasm, that, that images in churches were destroyed. And that is a wound to the West. Do you understand? That's a wound to the Western church because in the Western church by this point in time, and we're talking now 6th, 7th, 8th centuries, the Western Roman Empire has been gone since 476. So this is a wound to the West because in the West, with, especially with the collapse of the empire, there is, there's, there's a need to be able to teach, to instruct, to catechize people about the faith in a way that doesn't involve the written word because of the, fall, the, the loss of literacy that comes in the wake of the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Y'all tracking me? Everybody tracking me? So, so do you understand that how images in the Western church would be special, more special, because it's a way to tell the story? I guarantee you, you can walk into any medieval church in, in Europe today, in Western Europe today. You walk into any church from the high Middle Ages to the late Middle Ages, and maybe even into the Renaissance era, but, but certainly the period... We think about the, 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 high, the high period of church building, which happens in the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. You can walk into any church, and you can read it like a book if you know the key, right? You can read them like books. And why is that? Because that's what they were, to tell the whole story of our salvation in imagery for people who couldn't read. Well... The East doesn't have the problem of the loss of literacy. The Eastern Empire lives on with the capital at Constantinople until 1453, when it, the East finally fell to the Ottoman Turks. So my point is that this is a huge divide too. You have a divide of language, you have a divide of literacy, and you have this, this sort of wound to the West of iconoclasm, the destruction of images. Uh, that, really, that really is a wound to the West. So there's some other issues that are divisive. For instance, in the West, the Nicene Creed was modified with the addition of three little words. Anybody know what they are? And the Son. And the Son. That the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And the Son was added in the West to the Nicene Creed. Um, probably we think this began to creep in into the Western versions of the, of the Creed quite early after, after the Council at Nicaea, maybe as early as the, as the 5th century. But by the time of Charlemagne, um, 8th and early 9th century, it was fully adopted that language was fully merged into the creed in the West. This is a wound to the East. It's a wound to the East. Why is it a wound to the East? They were not consulted. The church together had formulated the creed at Nicaea in 325 
finalized that language at Constantinople in 381. Together, the whole church together, Western bishops, Eastern bishops, we were not divided yet. And now the Western church has seemed to have acted unilaterally to add three words. Okay, and so how many of you in here would sit here and think, okay, well, it's just three words, what's the big deal? What if it were one word? What if it were just one word? What if we moved to punctuation point? <laughs> I mean, like, how big would this ha issue have to be to create a theological challenge? There's that, and there's also the fact, of course, that we just simply didn't consult the East. A creed that was, that was created, a creed that came into being at an ecumenical council should be discussed at another ecumenical council. And so what was a wound to, to, the, um, to the Eastern Church? There are, there are actually doctrines that are developing in the Western Church um, that are not, not necessarily different from what's being taught in the East, but we're using different words. Purgatory, for instance. Um, the Eastern Church had trouble with the use of that word. It's meaning purgation, had a little bit of trouble with that. Um, the fact that there is, as I said, there's a language difference. There is the, the fact that um, um, you have, uh, in, in, the way, in, excuse me, in the East, uh, this is after the 11th century, uh, Eastern priests continued in the practice of marrying which to this day, Eastern Orthodox priests can marry. In the West, by the 11th century, that was not allowed. And so you've got another, sort of another issue that divides them. The issue of images is probably the single most important one, though. That, that loss of, of the three-dimensional image uh, in the East. Okay, so then what happens is in the year 1054, Pope St. Leo IX sent a diplomat, a legate, his, his envoy, think of an ambassador, uh, whose name was Humberto, he sent him to Constantinople for discussions with the patriarch of Constantinople, whose name was Michael. Okay. The discussion was to be about how to resolve some of the differences between the Eastern and Western churches. How can we create a greater sense of unity even though we have this geographic divide and this cultural divide. We're all one church. We defined the person and nature of Jesus Christ together. Let's get back together on this. Well, the patriarch was, was mad about several things. The patriarch refused to see the papal envoy, Humberto, for about eight weeks. And Humberto's just hanging out in Constantinople trying to get an audience with the patriarch. And the patriarch refuses to see him. So Humberto gets a sort of, you know, a burr under his saddle too. And on July 16th of 1054, Humberto walked into the magnificent church of the Hagia Sophia and he laid on the altar a writ of excommunication for the Patriarch of Constantinople. Signed by Pope St. Leo IX. Hmm. Except that Pope Leo IX had been dead for about six weeks when this occurred. When this occurred. So I've always had this question. Does that mean that like papal envoys were traveling with blank writs of excommunication that the Pope had already signed and all they had to do was fill in a name? You know, like you get a parking ticket or whatever, you just peel it off? I've always wondered about that because it is, it is inexplicable. So the excommunication of the Patriarch of Constantinople was therefore invalid. It was invalid. But the wound, the injury was already done. It's too late to say, oh, we didn't mean it. Right? The wound was already there. So we call this, actually call this a, the, the great schism. You know, S-C-H-I-S-M, schism. When you think about the word schism, 
uh, you can't just think about a division because the word actually means far more than that. It, that, that word, uh, to say it's divided doesn't go far enough. A schism is like a tear, and it's a tear where you've left frayed edges. Like if you ever wanted to put this back together, it's going to take more than just lining the page up. Does that make sense? I think that it conveys that, that, that the proper sense is that this is a tear and a tearing apart. And we have sought unity and restoration ever since. Ever since 1054. How many of you noticed what the image was on the top of the flock note that I sent out? What was the image? Yeah, it was, it was an image of the patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew, and he's the ecumenical patriarch of the Eastern Church, and Pope Francis. And if you notice sort of, sort of the posture is Pope Francis has his head sort of in the patriarch's chest, and the patriarch is kissing him on the top of the head. So these ecumenical dialogues have been going on, especially since Pope Francis, well, actually going back much further than that, of course, um, especially beginning in the spirit of Vatican II, a great sense of reconciliation. But this ecumenical dialogue that has gone on between Pope Francis and Bartholomew has been so encouraging, uh, I think, to both sides of the divide because there is a willingness, at least, to recognize each other as brothers. And, of course, one of the wounds in the, in the East has been that they don't recognize the Pope as being anything other than a brother bishop. Right? That he is the first. He has primacy. He is the first among equals. So that, so that Pope Francis is no different than the Patriarch of Constantinople except in terms of primacy. Primacy doesn't mean most important or in charge. It simply means first among honor, right? First among equals uh, in, the, in the sort of the tradition of, of St. Peter. So it's interesting that, that to watch this, this dialogue unfold in our own age as we, as we work towards uh, bringing Eastern and Western churches back together. Let's, don't, over, don't ever stop praying for this. Um, I mean, we know that in the eternal sense, this, this schism is already healed that we are all one, right? And all other schisms, all other tears that happen after this. But this one especially, because this was the, this is the apostolic church. The Eastern church and the Western church, this is the apostolic faith, okay? Uh, and I think, I think we should grieve that. So, obviously this is a huge moment, therefore, in church history. Y'all got it? We need to review number one is... Council of Nicaea and our Nicene Creed. Number two is the Great, the Great Schism of 1054. Okay. Let's talk about a different kind of schism. Um, what you're looking at there is um, Palace of the Pope in Avignon in France. It's a different kind of schism. This is a different kind of tear, a different kind of divide that happens with the roots in a major controversy of the 14th century. All right, in 1309, y'all with me? Why do I keep getting this echo? I wonder why that's happening. In 1309, Pope Clement V decided he was going to move the papal headquarters from Rome to Avignon in France. The Holy See is going to move. Now, I don't want to speculate, but Pope Clement V was a cousin of the French king, and I think this may have had something to do with it. <clears throat> Might have had something to do with it. Uh, he was a cousin, first cousin of the French king, um, Philip the Fair, uh, Philip IV. And let's please remember that they don't call Philip the Fair because he was a nice guy. It's because he was handsome. He was supposedly incredibly handsome. He was called Philip the Fair. He was anything but fair. To all the world, it looked like though, regardless of, of whether that played a factor or not, optics are important. To all the world, it looked like the church was a puppet of the French king. Because the, what's the reason neophytes? Where's the neophytes? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> 
putting you on the spot. What's the reason that the Holy See, the Apostolic See, is in Rome? P Peter was the first bishop of Rome, okay? And it, has, it actually has dual apostolicity, Peter and Paul, right? There's a reason it's in Rome. That's where the bishop of Rome is. <laughs> That's where bishops reside or in their dioceses, yes, in their sees. Well, the Bishop of Rome moves to Avignon, France. And then what happens is, and if it doesn't look bad enough, right, that somehow the Pope is a puppet of the French king, if that doesn't look bad enough, then we have the Hundred Years' War that breaks out between England and France right about 20 years after this. So you've got the, the papal headquarters in Avignon. France is at war with England. How many, how many English kings do you think want to send money to a papacy located in Avignon, France? Right? Located in the land of your enemy. You're going to send them money? So the church becomes a little short of funds. And this is not, okay, I, I didn't promise you a rose garden today. I told you we were going to talk about the peak moments, and some of this is ugly. But it is, it is the real history of the church. And again, it struck me yesterday how much these human moments just come back and reinforce for us the work of the divine in this institution. Because this is one of the ugliest periods of church history. The Avignon papacy became one of the most scandalous periods of church history. They began selling church offices, right? What's your limit on your MasterCard? Would you like to be a bishop? Would you like to be the abbot of a monastery? Okay. The beginning of the selling of indulgences. The beginning of that. And the eternal city of Rome, meanwhile, is sort of just falling into decay and collapse and decline. And it's being, you know, I mean, there's, there's nobody, nobody's traveling there. There's no pilgrims going there. There's no church business can be, being conducted there. And this prompted a young woman. Talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. What do you suppose the voice of a woman would matter in the 14th century? Well, let's not forget who announced the resurrection was a woman, right? So why should it surprise us then that in the 14th century it's a young woman, St. Catherine of Siena, who wrote very boldly to Pope Gregory XI urging him to, quote, act like a man, end quote. Act like a man and do the right thing. Move the church back to its apostolic root. Move, move it back to Rome. So he did. <laughs> he, he did. Never underestimate the power, right? He did. And he moved it back to Rome in 1377, late 1377. So the, the papacy was actually located in Avignon from 1309 to 1377. Long time. Moves it back in late 1377 and then promptly died. The Pope died. Triggering, of course, a new college of cardinals to elect a new Pope. Y'all with me so far? Because I'm not through with the drama. <laughs> if you think, oh, this is good, we've moved the church back to Rome, everything's good, don't settle there. Don't get comfortable. Because the College of Cardinals meets in Rome and elects a new pope, Urban VI. Validly elected, right? The College of Cardinals meets together in Rome. He's validly elected. The College of Cardinals has been in existence a couple of hundred years at this point in time. This is a valid election. And the French cardinals within the conclave decided they didn't like the outcome so they convened their own conclave and elected their own pope, Clement VII. Are you confused yet? Because it gets so much better. 
Just be glad I'm going to leave out all the names and all the generations of popes. But this is where it begins. Urban VI, who is elected, validly elected in Rome by the College of Cardinals. Clement VII, who's elected by the French Cardinals. He moves, he moves his headquarters to Avignon. Urban VI is in Rome. We have two popes. Which one is the real pope and which one is the anti-pope? And that's a real term, by the way. Which one's the anti-pope? Neophytes, anybody want to guess? Come on. Who's the real one? Good. Why is it urban? He was validly elected by the a calling, the conclave of cardinals meeting in Rome, by long-standing, now two, over two-century precedent, <clears throat> this is the valid election. So the one in Avignon is technically considered what history calls an anti-pope. It took two councils of the church to resolve this. Can you imagine what a scandal it would cause today if this happened? And at, Well, maybe more of a scandal because it would be so, it would be so much in our social media, right? Right. Pope Urban VI excommunicates Clement VII. Pope Clement VII excommunicates Pope Urban VI. I mean, could you see the headlines? Even that's exactly what happened. And it took two councils of the church to resolve this. First, in 1409, there's a council held in Pisa, as in like Leaning Tower of Pisa. This was to come together, choose a new pope with the idea that the other two, of course, would then step down. So, the Council of Pisa elects John the 23rd. Yes, you've heard that name again in history. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Elects John the 23rd, and now we have three popes because the other two will not step down. So we have a pope in Rome, a pope in Avignon, and now we have a pope in Pisa. So we have a Roman line. Y'all are looking at me like you don't believe me. You can go to the Vatican website and see this. There's a Roman line, there's an Avignon line, and there's a Pisan line. And next to each one of those Avignon popes and the Pisan popes, you will see anti-pope. They're not validly elected. That's why there's another John the 23rd in the 20th century. That's why there's another Pope Clement the 7th in the 16th century. It's because these were not valid elections. The other two, though, refused to step down. So it looks to all the world like there are three popes. So what are we going to do? <laughs> Trial by ordeal. <laughs> no. Well, that works so well, let's call another council. <laughs> so the Council of Constance in northern Italy then met in 1417, and this time there's something else at play. The Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund showed up with his army and surrounded the building, surrounded the council, and said, I don't know what y'all are going to do, but we're leaving here with one pope. <laughs> so isn't this interesting? Isn't this interesting? That throughout the entire peak of the Middle Ages, if you looked at from about the 11th century through now the, into the early 15th century, one of the most dominant themes of that period of history is this relationship conflict between church and state. Church and state. Church and state. Constant theme. Struggles between popes and kings and emperors. So isn't it interesting that you have a major scandal, a major conflict in the church that is settled how? By a secular entity intervening in the affairs of the church and saying, uh, my army's outside, y'all choose somebody. And the other three are stepping down. And oh, and if you want to choose one of those other three, that's fine but we're leaving here with one pope. And you know I'm paraphrasing a good bit of what happened here. 
I suspect uh, the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund put it far more eloquently and probably more colorfully than I just did. So the papal names of Clement the Seventh and John the Twenty Third were validly used in the future, but. But this was quite the scandal. And oh, by the way, the Council of Constance elected Martin V. Okay? And from that point forward, the Roman line resumes as a single unbroken line. So this prompts a great question, I think, for... It, it prompts a great question for the coming age, the coming 16th century, that would look at these events of, of the... Um, sort of the, the schism between the, the Avignon papacy being reunited with Rome in 1377, and then you have the, the creation of a brand new schism with three popes at one point in time. Wouldn't it be natural for any thinking person in the 16th century to look at that and go, there might be something wrong with the church? That maybe, hold, hold your question. So that maybe we would need to rethink the idea of authority, maybe we would need, need to rethink the legitimacy of that institution. Okay, I'm not saying that the, the, the institution is not legitimate. What I'm saying is that thinking people were looking at the church and saying, what is going on? We have the benefit of hindsight and know what? That Christ's promise in Matthew's gospel is what? On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So with the benefit of hindsight, you can look at these things in history and know the Holy Spirit was guiding this all along. There was never a moment where people, I'm sure there were moments where people thought, maybe not, but there was never a moment when the church was not governed by the Holy Spirit. Never a moment that that happened. And just think of the great stories we have to tell now. Right? But this actually leads to something else. Okay? The calling of the Council of Trent in 1545, this would be the fourth moment in our church history survey here, the calling of the Council of Trent, which was actually a response to, to specific abuses in the church that had been highlighted by the Protestant movement. The Council of Trent didn't meet because Protestants made it meet. The Council of Trent had actually been, a Reformed Council had been on the, on the minds of the greatest prelates of the church going back long before Martin Luther, but because Eastern Europe was under the threat of Islam and there was actually an invasion where the, the, uh, there's a Muslim army that reaches almost into Vienna, there was a delay in calling the council, so it happens it looks like it happens in response to Protestantism, but, and it does deal with Protestantism, but it was going to be called anyway. It's a reform council, 1545. The abuses of practice that were going on in the church over the centuries, things like the selling of offices, the selling of indulgences, the fact that you have bishops who are not living in their dioceses. The corruption of the morals of clergy, the fact that there is no, absolutely no um, standard for seminary education, that you have priests who are, who are priests who don't know the mass because they haven't been properly formed and properly trained. So all of these things Trent was called to address. So it's not just a response to the Protestant movement but to the awareness that reform was needed in the church. I have always objected to the use of the term Protestant Reformation. I've always objected to the use of that term. Do you know why? Because in order to reform an institution, you have to be in the institution. Protestants didn't reform the church. The church reformed the church, and that happened at Trent, and it's happened ever since. Um, this is why you'll often hear me refer to it as the Protestant movement. The true Catholic Reformation happened at the Council of Trent in those 18 years that, that Trent met. Um, it met in actually three sessions over 18 years, 18 years, yeah. Uh, it spanned the lives of three popes. 
Paul III, Julius III, Pius IV, three different popes uh, that oversee this, this council. And what it does by the end of it is it affirms all of the core Catholic teachings of the ancient church, the apostolic faith that would be extremely recognizable to you today. And the reason it is is because nothing changed. It, confer it, it affirms all the core teachings, reformed the clergy, um, committed to seminary education, building, funding, uh, seminaries to educate priests, and one of the greatest champions for that was a man named St. Charles Borromeo, who was a firebrand for, for building seminaries and overall renewed the church. There's so much that can be said about Trent, I and mean, we could do like a whole series just on Trent because it produced 17 what we call dogmatic constitutions. And if you, if you could read through one dogmatic constitution without your eyes glazing over, right, uh, you'd be doing well. But there's 17 of them that come out of that that affirms things like the church is the universal depository of truth. Don't look anywhere else. It's in this church. It is here in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Um, it affirms the, um, it gives not, not primacy of place, well, yeah, primacy of place. It's not the official translation. The church doesn't have an official translation of scripture, but it affirms the primacy of place of St. Jerome's Vulgate translation. Um, it um, affirmed the exact ordering of the canon of scripture. How many of you know that Martin Luther moved the order around of the New Testament? Do y'all know this? Yeah, he wanted to remove the book of James, <laughs> take it out. He took the apocryphal text, or we, what we would call the Deuterocanonicals, and moved them to the end, and then reordered some of the books, some of the Pauline epistles. Because he didn't think that the council at Carthage had done it correctly. Right? So... The Council of Trent affirms, no, the way that the church ordered the scriptures is the way they stay. It affirmed our sacramental theology and so much more. And finally, because I know I'm running out of time in a little bit here, I'm only time for questions. Finally, I want to touch upon, if, if it's interesting, if you look at the pictures, Trent and, <laughs> grown a little bit, haven't we? Um, the... Um, touch upon the calling of the Second Vatican Council in 1962 by Pope who? John the 23rd, <laughs> not the, um, not the anti-pope, but the real one. Pope John the 23rd also extended then, of in course, into the papacy of Pope uh, St. Paul VI. I know we skipped just like 400 years forward. <laughs> we went from 1545 to 1962. Please don't think that nothing happened in the church between 1545 and 1962. There's really cool stuff that did happen. But I figured y'all wanted to go home before um, like 4 o'clock tomorrow. <laughs> so, The 21st Council of the Church, the last ecumenical council of the church to be called, it was Second Vatican. The council called together, in case that looks a little large to you, it's about 2,500 bishops, 2,500 bishops, thousands of observers, uh, auditors, um, uh, religious orders, uh, men and women, uh, lay men, lay women, also uh, uh, there, in four sessions at uh, St. Peter's Basilica between 1962 and 1965. Cultural changes in the aftermath of World War II is really what prompted the calling of this council, a special council that would consider the church in the modern world. And technically now, 1962, we're in the postmodern world. These meetings did just that. Um, the documents in total that came out of it are just voluminous. 16 documents, but each document's several hundred pages. Uh, laying a foundation for the church that we know today. A major theme of this, I mentioned this before, a major theme of Second Vatican was reconciliation. To renew our ecumenical efforts, not just with our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters, but with Protestants, to encourage Protestant and post-Protestant 
uh, dialogue with the Catholic Church, that they all may be one. That is the goal of the church, is that we all may be one again. Because remember that Christ's will is unity. If man is divided, whose will is that? That's man's will. That's man's will at work. That's human will. Divine will is unity. And so the major emphasis really that comes out of this is to encourage those ecumenical dialogues with the Eastern Church, with Protestant groups, post-Protestant groups. And y'all know what I mean by post-Protestants. Groups that come about out of Protestant churches that now don't identify as being part of their original Protestant root, much less the Catholic root. Yeah, I know. Well, you should see it on a tree. You should look at it on a timeline, right? All the branches just go 40,000 different directions. But to encourage everybody to, to come back together and encouraging us to pray. Uh, actually, the uh, uh, Second Vatican allowed for Catholics to pray with other uh, Christian denominations, encourages friendships with non-Christian faiths. Uh, and opened the door for languages besides Latin to be used during the Mass, uh, Mass in the vernacular language. Um, I, I know that this is, this is something that a lot of people have had trouble with. Uh, if you knew the Latin Mass, all of a sudden to have your Mass in English or Mass in whatever language you spoke seemed a little bit um, difficult at first. The, um, the orientation of the altar, the altar, of course, comes out so that the priest is, face, is facing the people. Um, the orientation of the, of, of the priest toward the people. So lots of stuff, lots of rich uh, traditions come out of Vatican II. And if you haven't already seen this, I highly recommend it. Bishop Barron has done a great series on Vatican II, exploring um, what some people have, have sort of characterized as controversy. He actually frames it quite beautifully as what I touched upon at the beginning, the Holy Spirit working through the church throughout, century, throughout the centuries. That the Holy Spirit is at movement in the church and this is how we know it. So before you put your human test to something, she says, looking at Vatican II, before you put your human test to that, consider the authority that goes, the authority behind an ecumenical of the council, an ecumenical council of the church goes back how far? Somebody tell me, when was the first council called? The Council of Jerusalem. It's described in the Acts of the Apostles. That's the model. When there is, is there ever going to be human conflict? I know we shudder to think of this. Is there ever going to be human conflict? Ever going to be disagreement about anything? How do we discern the Holy Spirit? We go to the biblical model. We go to the model of church history. We go to the apostles, the apostles themselves. Don't you think they were human beings? Did they ever have conflict? Ever want to punch each other out? When there was a disagreement, they came together and under the, the invocation of the Holy Spirit, they determined God's will for the church. That is our model of authority. This is what sets us apart, by the way, from every other Protestant or post-Protestant denomination that when there is a disagreement, what happens? They split. The resolution for conflict in that model is to separate. Our model for resolution is to come together to unite under the guidance of the Holy Spirit whose church, who is in charge of the church. Okay? So I really, I really, I can't stress that to you enough that my point of choosing these five key moments is that each of them illustrate the life, the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. Don't you think that people in the 13th or 14th centuries, or excuse me, 14th or 15th centuries, during this schism and during this great scandal in the papacy, don't you think that people questioned 
Who's in charge here? Do you think that people might have despaired even? I don't like that Pope. I don't like what he said, right? Why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? Why don't they fix it this way? If only somebody would listen to me, this would have all been worked out. How many times do we say that today? <laughs> Why didn't you ask me what I think, right? But that's not how we live our lives as Catholics. We submit our will to the will of the one who is in charge of the church. And it's not me. It's not you. Here's a news flash. It's not all of us assembled in this room collectively. Right? The Holy Spirit is always at work in the life of the church. In the Gospel of Matthew, as I said, Jesus said to St. Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I often, I often look at that one line of scripture to be reminded that that is a promise. That's not like Jesus saying something to make Peter feel good. That's a promise. The gates of hell shall not prevail. The church is always under his care, his protection, his guidance, and we can submit to that understanding and never fear that his promise is not true. We don't ever have to fear that. So each of these little vignettes today um, are moments in human history, to be sure, but with real uh, political consequences maybe in their time. But they show us, if you can take the 30,000-foot view, they show us the great providence that God has always had for his church and for his people. All right. That's all I got. Oh, I wasn't that needed. Pause. Questions? Questions? Yes. Question? Yes. When you were talking about the three popes and stuff, so basically you sat around with them and said, pick one, and they said, okay, one of them. And then they got Martin. Right. The other three stepped down. Okay. And they elected Martin V. Right. Yeah, because because the the priest um, celebrated mass at Orientum. Yeah. This back to the people, but but theologically the, the the meaning is very beautiful because the priest is leading the people. Yeah, okay. The priest has gathered together all the prayers and is leading the people. Yeah, with God. So it really is a priestly posture. Question. Anybody have a question? Yes. Yes. Right. Because the, the, the yeah, it's a great question. Because the actions of the next council, of the Council of Constance, overrode that decision. And that decision stood. Martin V would be Pope. Mm -hmm. And you can, I mean, the, to, not to get too much in the weeds on this, but you can also argue, or, or it has been argued, that um, Peace's decision was invalid because the other two refused to step down. Yeah. What else? Any of our neophytes have any um, questions or things that didn't really make sense or you'd like to know a little more about? Well, I either did a really good job or I just thoroughly confused you, so. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the first one. Thank you. Thank you, Norbert. Norbert's my, Norbert's my biggest fan here. Yes. Many times. Most notorious time that the Pope had to escape from Rome. Well, okay, so you have, I'm thinking specifically about one that happened in the 11th century involving Pope Gregory VII, 
who had to flee for his life because uh, the Holy Roman Emperor uh, brought an army against him and replaced him with a new pope. That happened actually in, in, the, in the 10th century as well. Um, that's the reason you see that the College of Cardinals was created, was to depoliticize the process of choosing a pope and take it out of the emperor's hands. Because all an emperor had to do was raise an army and go to Rome and remove a pope. Gregory VII died an old man in exile. It's a really sad story. Um, and then, of course, you've got you know, the other extreme. You've got the example of, um, of Pope Alexander VI, the Renaissance pope, who was um, Rodrigo Borgia. Do y'all know the name, Borgias? Probably the most scandalous pope in history. Um, had mistresses at the Vatican, about 14 illegitimate children. Um, but did a great job of finding really powerful positions for them. Uh, Cesare Borgia became a cardinal. and um, I mean, it, it was, but it was a scandalous time in the church. And so, so that, see, when I, when I hear about that, and like even Vatican historians don't make any attempt to apologize for this, because remember, it's a human institution. So even the worst of these popes, and do y'all remember, some of you might, might recall this, that I did a class called the Bad Popes. Do y'all remember that? Yes. Wasn't that fun, the Bad Popes? <clears throat> because it's a reminder to us that it's a human institution, and even the worst popes in history, and I could name about five of those if you wanted to, just off the top of my head. That's without thinking about it too much. If we thought about the Bad Popes as they've been labeled, not a single one of them taught heresy. They might have done a lot of scandalous things, but they didn't teach heresy. They didn't lead the church doctrine into error. You know? So the big takeaway, people, is that we live in, we live and, and worship and minister within a human institution. Yeah? Yes. I'm going to start bringing popsicle sticks. I'm going to give everybody popsicle sticks. And when you're out of popsicle sticks, you can't speak anymore. a lot of my thought process is I grew up overseas, and so that was the, the Catholic that I was introduced. Right. And I didn't know what Protestants were other than not Catholic. But as an adult, I kind of had my own uh, issue of, I see other religions like Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Muslim, it's not that big of a deal of a difference because of their, like even in the Quran and all of these different belief systems, they all talk about a mass of blood. So there's commonalities within them. That being said, I have a very difficult time sometimes talking to some of my Protestant friends because like when I'm still, I look at her and I said, I don't understand how it's 2023 and you go someplace and say, I don't like what this person's teaching, it's gonna go over here. Right. I said, you don't see that and to me, I call them the poor, poor religions like Judaism, so the two sets of Judaism and you know, Catholicism and the rest of them are kind of like to me like these core beliefs and that everybody else is kind of, I don't like this so I'm going to create my own and I said, but it's 2023 how are you watching, reading books to kids about dinosaurs and Adam and Eve? That's, that's why we have to, that's why we are all called to evangelize. It's, it's um, what Pope Francis has referred to as the new evangelism is because that this is, we have, I'm going to say this again, the Catholic Church is the universal depository of all truth, period, the end. It doesn't mean that there is not, not images of truth or semblances of truth or partial truths in other religious systems, even in other, and certainly in Protestant, in Protestant denominations. That's one of the, the documents of Vatican II would say that. But the Catholic Church has the fullness of the truth. So all I have to do as a Catholic is guess what? All I have to do as a Catholic is to submit my will to that. 
That's a big call. And it's a difficult call sometimes. But we keep teaching the truth because we have it. The fullness of it is right here. Will that preach? Sound like I was preaching. Deacon, was I preaching a little bit? I was preaching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll let you borrow it sometime. <laughs> yes, I had a question back here. I'm not sure about the, um, after the schism, how that happened. Um, the Orthodox have, I think, you may know this, how, there's a few more of the Deuterocanonicals that are included in the Orthodox Bible. Is that correct? Yeah. So 1054, after 1054, I'm sure, is when that became sort of official. But the Council of Carthage, which, and, and y'all, in the Orthodox tradition, they don't really, in the Eastern Orthodoxy, they don't really consider the canon of Scripture closed. They wouldn't say it's closed. There is a, a grouping that is canonically agreed upon that came out of the Universal Church in the 4th century. But um, moving forward from there, I'm not really sure when when that sort of separation, it would have to be after 1054, I'm guessing. That's a great question. Do you know the answer? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm a big believer in the, uh, I wish I could read St. Jerome's Vulgate, but, but I'm, a, I'm a big believer in the, I, li I personally like the NABRE, the New American Bible Revised Edition, which is the Catholic Bible. Catholic translation of the scriptures, right? And, and when I teach, and I'll just go ahead and tell you all this because it's public. I mean, you could go online and hear a lecture and hear me say it. Um, when I teach history of Christianity, I, um, I do not, uh, and, and students have to read, there are certain scriptures they have to read, a couple of the gospels and Pauline letters that they have to read in my class. And I don't allow, I don't allow the use of the, uh, the King James Version. It's got over four. It's got over four thousand translation errors in it. I would be, be careful about what American Bible. The New American Bible Revised Edition (NABRE) is a Catholic translation of the Scripture, and the Douay Reims, also from the nineteenth century, is a good translation. <laughs> well, the NABRE should. The Deuterocanonical texts have been published in every Bible right up until the 19th century, even among Protestant groups. So, I feel like I've just been on like um, Jeopardy. <laughs> All right, guys. What are we doing next week, Deacon? Oh, I'll see y'all next week. All right, thank you.